outside the box is what we we enjoy in the west we kind of encourage it in a way that's why we have you know innovative thinkers and japan does not it's not completely without these people but they 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 thrive despite the system not because of it they have to be like mavericks and you know probably they get in trouble at school and they probably get bullied because they don't follow the system that's why in a cafe they don't they're giving milk because the, the, the boss has obviously said we don't give milk with tea we don't give butter with bread こんにちは皆さん。ビジネス・セクセス・ジャパンのポッドキャストへようこそ。Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Business Success Japan podcast. This is your host, Lydia Bukelman. My main goal here is to create an easily accessible resource for those who want to develop Japan specific communication skills, especially in business. While I don't promise to make you fluent in Japanese, I hope that you will walk away from each episode with a skill, Piece of information or shift in mindset that will help you be more effective in your interactions with Japanese business people. A quick reminder to please rate and review the podcast if you enjoy it. It goes a long way to helping others find the podcast and learn more, and it also helps me to keep going as an independent creator. So, thanks in advance. Today, I'm sharing a conversation with Richard Mort, An international communication specialist who has decades of immersion in Japanese language and culture, cross cultural understanding, and fluency in French and German as well. His work includes translation, editing, copywriting, and marketing services. Richard has a long history in Japan, beginning his career there as a young bachelor, and he is now in the process of setting up shop in Germany with his family. But before we get into the interview, let's go over a little bit of Japanese. In the previous episode, we went over one of my personal favorite words. ボーネンカイボウネンカイボーネンカイボーネンカイ refers to a year end party, usually in the context of a company. However, if you look at the kanji used in this word, it literally translates to forget the year meeting. If you want to hear more, be sure to check out the previous episode. This week, I want to teach you a phrase that I bring up later in the conversation with Richard. While it may seem like a pretty simple, benign phrase, I'll explain later why it means so much for people living and working in Japan. Nihongo jozu. Ni ho n go jozu. Nihongo jozu. Nihongo is the Japanese word for the Japanese language. Jozu is the Japanese word for good at or skilled. So, this phrase is a casual way of saying good at Japanese. The more polite way of saying this that you're probably more likely to encounter is Nihongo wa jozu desu ne, which a Japanese person may say in response to even the most basic of Japanese. In contrast, the way I use Nihongo jozu in this episode is a tongue in cheek way that foreigners in Japan often refer to how common it is for Japanese people to compliment someone who maybe can't even say more than a heavily accented konnichiwa. This isn't something to take personally or get frustrated about, though, as it really is just a way to be polite and make conversation rather than any sort of slight or insult. However, many foreigners in Japan make it a goal to graduate from the Nihongo Jozu response from native Japanese speakers to the coveted, How long have you been living in Japan? As that usually marks the point at which your Nihongo has truly become Jozu. But without any further delay, let's get into today's conversation with Richard Mort. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Would you mind introducing yourself to my audience? Yeah, thanks, Lydia. It's a pleasure to be here. It took a while to get the time, but I'm really happy I could be here. My name is Richard Maud,、uh, rich to my friends.、Um, I'm from the UK originally. I lived in Japan since 2002, and in that time, I lived six months in Aichi Pen, then eight years in Tokyo, and the rest of the time in Queen and Kobe, where I am now. As I speak to you, it's 2021, we're in the middle of a crazy pandemic around the world. I think everyone listening is probably under the same, in the same boat, so to speak. Personally, it's, it's been tough, but I have a, a big move to Germany coming up in April. So it seems like the right time to reflect on Japan and what, it's, what I've done here and, you know, and share a few memories of people and experiences. And I'm really happy to have the chance to do so. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm glad that we could be a part of your wrapping things up in Japan process. <laughs> Might be a、yeah. little cathartic to go over your experiences before you leave. So, could you tell us a little bit more about your history with Japan? Yeah, well, we have 
it, it could be a very long conversation, but I'll try to not make it too long. Going back to my childhood, I grew up in the southwest of England. I'm from the UK, and um, which was a happier time at that time. I have to say, no COVID and no Brexit. But uh, I grew up in Devon, which is very green, and it's the kind of the postcard image of, the, of Britain, which American people especially have this image of green hills and cows grazing and, you know, buildings which are very old and uh, scones and jam. Actually, it's all that. To be honest, it's, it, it fits a stereotype. And that was a small town of 11,000 people. And that was where I grew up. Um, it's called Tavistock. Uh, and when I was a child, I was in an idyllic situation with, by most standards and pretty lucky. But I used to tell mum, mum, I want to go and live in Tokyo because it was the polar opposite. It was like uh, the big lights, the bright lights of big city on the other side of the world. You know, we have London, but that was my own country. So it was less fascinating than Tokyo. So that was one of the recurring themes as a child. And then when I was a teenager, when I was 13, we moved to North England, to Sheffield. And just, this is 30 years ago, I'm embarrassed to say, but there, 30, 29 years ago, I just couldn't sleep one night, and it's before Facebook and so on, before mobile phones. So I go downstairs and switch on the TV, and BBC has this educational program, BBC Two, and it's like overnight they have these programs that people record, and they watch the next day. And just so happened, the program I watched happened to be called Japanese Language and People. And it was the end of the bubble. So Japan was really, you know, coming off the bubble. And what I saw was a kind of combination of tradition and, you know, the, the beautiful shrine in Hiroshima, but also the West Shinjuku skyscrapers. And it, and it kind of grabbed me. And probably, you know, I thought back to those times in the little town in Devon. And I thought to myself, this is, you know, where I want to be at one at some point. And I said, I definitely will be there. I've always been very stubborn and followed through. So that those two things together probably explained why I was why I came to Japan. But having said that, I, I studied French and German, not Japanese. I studied French and German, and I graduated and went to Singapore first. So it's Asia, but it's not Japan. It's almost like a British piece of Asia because you know it used to be British and uh, they play cricket and they drink tea. So it was like an easy springboard into Asia. They speak English, you know, Singapore English, but it's still English. So I spent five years there, and that was really a good grounding for Asia, I would say. But after five years, this kind of voice in my head that said, you know, Japan, it's time for Japan. So I felt it was time, and I learned a little bit, like, numbers and greetings, and I, I flew to Tokyo and, and started a job in Aichi for six months in a conversation school. And it was hard. The start was hard, but I, 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 did, I quickly kind of... After six months in Aichi, it was very hard. I went to Tokyo, and then things started getting better quite quickly. So, yeah, that, that's the start, the quick version. So how did you end up finding what you considered to be success, both with the language and with relationships in Japan then? Well, after six months in Aichi, I moved to Tokyo, and Aichi was tough for many reasons. I felt that living there would help me learn Japanese because it wasn't a big open space. It was actually not Nagoya. It was one hour from Nagoya even. So it was really countryside in Aka, you know, osmosis and as it go into the deep end. But it was too deep. And I, I, would, I would end up eating only at Saizuri and Mr. Donut because that was the only menus I could read, you know. And um, I got really, I didn't have a lot of money and uh, no, no friends in the country. So it was a tough time and the school took me on and the boss actually had some respect for me because she knew I wasn't enjoying it, but I, I sold it on. So after six months, she actually drove me to Tokyo all the way from Aichi because she felt like I'd done my best for six months. And how did I start success, getting success? I, I'm very intense. So when I set my mind to something, I, I really go at it 200% even more. So I decided that you know, an obvious job for me to do was editing and proofreading, even without Japanese skills, because I've always been a voracious reader and uh, I type fast and read fast. And I felt this was me. So I think my father-in-law passed away a few years ago, but at the time he bought me a nice new PC from Akihabara. And that was the kind of, you know, push I needed. And I, I remember registering with every single translation agency in Japan, literally the town pages, NTT town pages. I just have this tunnel vision. And I would email every email, even the ones without email, I would find the facts and fax them, you know. <laughs> I mean, that, to that extent, honestly, there were probably some people in, you know, different parts of Japan who still have that fax somewhere. But the thing is, that time was a boom. There wasn't the kind of level of artificial translation like now. There was still a bigger gap between Google Translate and what people can do. And so the work came like a river. I would open my PC and there'd be jobs waiting for me. 
And while the rate per word wasn't that amazing, my capacity to do it fast and well was really high. And honestly, I quickly built up the client base and I, I found work which suited me perfectly. And I mean, I don't want to brag or anything. I'm telling the truth here, but you know, they were boom years for me. I didn't have a kid yet. I have two kids now, but that was a, you know, I was still, I, I'd met who, my woman who's now my wife, but we were not married at that time. But um, I was living in Tokyo and it was my dream. So I made the dream come true and I wanted to enjoy it. So all the things you can do with money in Tokyo, probably I would do, you know, Lost in Translation, you've probably seen a film. I stayed mm. there. I, um, two or three years into my time in Japan, I became 30. And, you know, I was depressed. So I'm 30. And then this, my wife's friend said, no, we, we, we married. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a bit. Sorry, but we married after a year. Anyway, but I was still without a, uh, a child. So there was a, a, a nice shop in Ginza. I used to go once a week to have tea and cake. And I used to hang out in Ginza and Aoyama a bit. And, and uh, I asked the shop, can I have my party here? And normally they wouldn't do it, but they did it for me because I was a good customer. So middle of Ginza, the basement is you know, reserved for me. We have a chef from Paris who made a special menu for me. 24 friends came. I remember, I remember very well, actually. And the shop, it was like a wedding, more like a wedding than, than a birthday party. They did like roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and my lemon rang pie, my favorite food and a special cocktail. I even hired a projector to show some, some of my favorite movies to my friends. So that was a kind of, I would call it my bubble time in a way. Um, I was doing work which was lucrative, suiting me. I was working too hard and I didn't have the big network I have now, but I would go through cycles of very hard work and really kind of splurgy holidays because it's like recovery you know you put your foot down to the floor but then you want to enjoy all the things you can do in a big city or i fly to thailand you know and stay in a nice hotel in bangkok or chiang mai there's one anecdote i could give you many but one anecdote for example that time those years in tokyo you know the g8 summit happened in japan the g8 as it was the g8 not not g20 now but g8 and uh, at the time um uk gordon brown was the prime minister i think clinton was uh, the u.s president Anyway, they, they all went to Hokkaido, to Toyako. And there's a famous hotel called Windsor Hotel there. And Toyako is very beautiful, you know, it's a lake. And I saw it on TV, you know, super luxury hotel, like a, like a seven star level. And obviously locals didn't stay there. It was all kind of people from Tokyo. They hired a Russian harpist in the lobby. I remember the anecdote that the windows in the lobby were so big, they couldn't take them by truck. They had to get a helicopter to take the window panes because they were that big, you know. But I stayed there a week. Um, one of my, I had a very, very hard two months up to Christmas. And I remember taking a train from Ueno Station on Christmas Day, sleeper train, Cassiopeia. And obviously it's, um, it's not the fastest or the cheapest way to get there, but it's very exciting to take a sleeper train. You have like French food on the train. And, you know, those, those memories for me are priceless. It's, um, it's still fresh in my head and I really enjoyed it. Something I feel like maybe has fallen a little bit to the wayside recently because a lot of books and seminars focus on what types of qualities you need to develop in order to be successful but in reality what your sh your story shows is that if you have a strong enough why you can really just no matter what make it happen i think in terms of the work i found the right fit a perfect fit mm -hmm. for handing glove but in terms of success in Japan, moving on a bit to the medium and longer term, the social mm -hmm. success, because I feel I did have that in a really high, high level. But I never was naturally, I was never naturally a people person or a, a magnet for friends or something. I had a lot of in times in my life when I, I couldn't make friends with anyone, even the same gender or, you know, let alone the opposite sex. And, and it was, you know, it was full circle in Japan. But turning to Japanese, so during these years in Tokyo, eight years in Tokyo, where I really enjoyed my life I did feel the need to learn Japanese and it wasn't so much to make a living because I was making a good living anyway but it was more like there must be more doors that can open here because my friends at the time were only people who spoke English in Japan so obviously it was quite limited I used to go to a dentist in Ginza that spoke English I used to go to a hairdresser in Aoyama that did English-speaking hairdressing so my circle was all about the English-speaking service providers and uh this intensity I mentioned to you is also, I'd also apply it to when I was finding a teacher. So I looked at all the options, all the mediums where I could find a teacher from, for example, online agencies or even offline. I would email the school and say, can you send a teacher to my home? So working from home and my schedule was, was hectic with all the work coming in. So I didn't really want to commit to going to a, a 
central school, the ideal for me was having a teacher who come to see me. And I had some trial lessons and uh, I was living in Kichijoji at the time, which is you know, 20 minutes from Shinjuku, the west, west Tokyo. Very nice area. You know, I was lucky. It was really a nice area, very desirable. That was home in Tokyo. And a teacher came from Asakusa, you know, the other side of Tokyo. So about one hour door to door. And I'm still in touch with her. Not so much, but, you know, I still, I, I have to say a huge thank you to her. Because as anyone who learns Japanese knows, you have to do the hard work in the end. In the end, we haven't reached a stage where a teacher can put it into your head. They can encourage you and motivate you. They can help you structure stuff. But in the end, you have to do the hard work. I'm, I'm sure you know. And I, and I did, but she was a great motivator. She was, again, the right fit for me. She was like a, a Japanese mom in a way. She always used to bring a cream bun, you know, the Japanese way when she came to my house. And I actually don't like these Japanese habit of eating stuff full of cream, you know, the, the nana cream. And then I always used to say something like, oh, thanks, you know, I've just had lunch, so I'll put it in the fridge. And I never used to eat it. But that aside, she was a great teacher. And she she lived in near Sumida River. So when they had the fireworks, not now because of COVID, but before when they had the fireworks, Sumida Gawa fireworks, she used to invite us to her house on the roof to see the fireworks. You know, it was it was great. And some of her friends became my friends. So she wasn't just a teacher. She was more like a kind of a solid figure. And as I learned Japanese, doors definitely opened. And I saw them opening. And I think that motivated me to kind of go to events, meet people, speak to people. It never came naturally. But when I saw the effect it had, it kind of, because I never had it before, it was like a kind of drug. It's hard to describe, but the thrill I get in a way, or I used to get, social success was bigger because I didn't have any benchmarks before. It was like treading new ground. And it meant more for me for that reason. So yeah, I've always been full a full power person, full of energy. So I applied the same energy to socializing, you know, especially before I had a kid. And uh I would if it was an event or party, I would go international parties. That's another topic we could cover later. But you know this kind of when you when you're relatively new in Japan, you go to these parties, everyone's nice to you and everyone smiles at you. you get a lot of contact requests, you get a lot of business cards. And you come back to the party thinking, God, this is easy, this socializing thing, like I've I've made ten new friends today. And the reality is different, as we know, but at the time you 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 know, you, you have a buzz. Another another anecdote I remember from the early years is Asahi Televi, Asahi Televi. They they had the SMAP station with now now disbanded SMAP, you know, Katori Shingo and Co. And somewhere I'd read there was a job there, like you could be part of the audience. And uh, it's really exciting, you know, when you're new in Tokyo to be to have that opportunity. So I remember they only paid five thousand yen and they paid the taxi home. And you just had to stand there and clap. And so it was just, you know, it was nothing work, it was like grunt work, but it was exciting because it, it was the middle of Tokyo and it's a tele TV program. So you know, they they were good times. They were they were exciting times. I was living the dream, you could say. I guess it was like living the dream because I'd always imagined doing the stuff you could do in Tokyo when I was doing it. So it was a great feeling. Yeah. yeah, it's easy to underestimate the importance of getting that sort of positive feedback, like you mentioned with learning Japanese and then socializing too. Those seem like what really kept you going has getting that positive feedback helped you renew your energy to keep going and keep fighting for these things. I, I, I always describe myself as someone full of fire and I still still use that term because I don't know what it is, but it was driving me to work. And I very rarely said no to a job, for example. And that's, you know, not normal because as a freelancer, you, you multitask, but there's a limit. Of course, there's a limit. But my limit was very high. And I, I rarely said no. I, I prided myself. And it wasn't really just the money. I mean, the money was good, but it was more like, I don't know, I feel this dynamic urge to work. And when mom, my mum came to Japan three times in total, unfortunately she was due to come this uh, last year in March, and obviously it couldn't happen, but she came to see me three times in Japan from the UK. And of course, when I was at this peak of my work in Tokyo, I wanted to show her the best of Japan and treat her to the best stuff. And she never would expect it. Mum has quite a simple life. And uh, I... I took her, you know, on, on two weeks in Japan, 52 trains. We took 52 trains. I remember I counted them, two and a half weeks. And, you know, I, I put her in a green car every time because I wanted her to relax totally. And I, and I, I put her in nice hotels, you know. We, we flew to Kyoto on New Year's Day. We, we went to uh, Kinkakuji. And the last time she came to Japan, I guess I'm jumping again here, but the principle is the same. We stayed in a nice 
like a auberge, you know, not like a cardiocan, but like kind of Western style cardiocan, you could say. And they had an onsen outside, like a personal onsen. She wasn't that keen on the onsen shared, you know, because, you know, British people. And, but I said, Mum, this is a special chance because, you know, super luxury room and you don't usually get your own onsen. But we had our own onsen on the balcony. So I said, I'm going to have a nap now. So this is your chance to go in the onsen. No one else you should enjoy. And she did. And uh, I was very pleased that, you know, literally my hard work made that kind of thing possible. And she was quite emotional when I talked about it with her because you want her to be proud in a way, but like she was more like concerned that I was doing too much, you know, which is probably true. But, you know, they, they, I was happy that I could show her something special in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that you could have all those special experiences and share them with your family. That's really important. Before you mentioned to me that you've had some run-ins in your career when it comes to inflexibility with Japanese companies, would yeah, you yeah. be willing to share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I guess anyone who's been here a long time, like myself, would have these stories. The, the one that sticks in my mind really quite, quite clearly is the one from the early years in Tokyo. And I've, I've been freelancing almost all the time, but there was a company I worked for, they did Telephone English. I don't think they do this kind of thing now because there's too many ways to do it otherwise, but they literally would call company workers. It was Nissan. Nissan weren't employing me, but Nissan was using this telephone school to kind of check their employees' English. Mm. This, is, this is well before Carlos going, by the way. <laughs> I don't think they'd heard of him yet. Anyway, my job was to kind of get to the office in Shinjuku and call the employee and talk to them for a few minutes and make a kind of, you know, uh, assessment. And... It was a very Japanese company, I remember. And um, I lived in Setagaya at the time, not Kichijoji, but anyway, I had to take the Odaku train to Shinjuku. It wasn't that far, but you know, it's horribly crowded, much more than now. It was a really tough time. Anyway, I'm not a morning person, as I told you. And I got up and I was late. So I was rushing and I had a shirt on, but I didn't have a tie. And I literally had a choice between getting the train and going, getting there just on time or putting my tie on and probably missing the train. So I chose to not wear a tie and get to the office on time. And, you know, we weren't in front of the customer even. We weren't in front of the customer. We were doing telephone English. So in a way, what's the point, right? So the, but the boss or the president kind of noticed and he, he kind of called me and he, got, he yells at me for like 10 minutes, like, what are you doing not wearing a tie? It's disgusting, you know, and, and uh, really like, you know, and I, and I thought, don't need, so I, I, this is not me, you know, I'm, I'm not having this. And I just kind of quit. And uh, that was an um, extreme example. Um, day to day inflexibility. I'll give you an example. I love tea, by the way. I mean, I I can't function without tea. Maybe very British, but I, I love my tea. I'm, I'm I'm hopeless without it. So I would go to a cafe, and I like tea with milk. You know, asam tea. And uh, in Japan, it could be five or six hundred yen for a cup. Well, well, so be it. You know, I, I like my tea. So if it has to cost that much, it would cost that much even more sometimes. But then they they uh, they bring the tea. And I like with milk, and there's no milk in it. And, uh, and I say politely, I say, um, you know, can I have some milk, please? And they say something like, there's no milk. And I, st I stop and pause for a while, and I say, if you open that fridge behind you, there's definitely milk in there. Can you give me some milk, please? And I like in Japanese, firmly. And usually you get like um, a result, but you know, it, it's, it's, rob it's a robotic nature which does my head in a bit. And there was one memory, okay, in, in Ueno Station, they had a hard rock cafe, still have one. It was a hard rock cafe in Ueno Station. And I don't know why I was bothering to have a cup of tea in a hard rock cafe. It's not going to be nice, but you know, I have tea anywhere. So I, I go to hard rock and, um, you know, I just feel like a burger. But then I, I just felt like washing all the grease down with some tea. So I said to the, you know, the young student who's serving me, he brings some tea. And, and like I said, sorry, can I have some milk, please? And he didn't like that. He didn't like the fact I was asking for milk. So he, he comes, goes to the kitchen. I don't know, he probably does something to the milk, brings it back and he slammed, he slammed the jug down. And I, I got I sprang up and I got to the manager. I said, I'm not having that. I said, you know, you don't, this is disgusting. Like, I, I know what's expected, you know, and, I, I, and, you know, this kind of thing. But um, inflexibility, I'll give you a more recent example. I, I'm jumping, I've given you one from the past and very recently, you know, the COVID time. So COVID is difficult for all of us. Um, I'm moving to Germany in April, and for that purpose, I had to travel to Germany, even despite COVID in December. Really tough time, but I had to take the family. So I have two, two kids now. We have a baby, one year and a half, and we have a special needs boy who's 11, my wife. 
so you can imagine even just going alone would be hard enough and having four of us is kind of off the scale you know but um somehow i made it happen and we rely on as much help as possible for my son because he's hard work with special needs you know in japan i would say especially and before we went i knew about the two weeks quarantine but i said to uh, a lawyer friend who'd helped me get permanent residency i said can you check with the powers that be that my son will be able to go to school or be able to have some help and provision because they do say when you have these two weeks you can go shopping you have to buy food so avoid people don't take public transport you can go shopping you see you know see that's not that many but equally important for us is having help with the kids because you know we've got the baby and we've got special needs kid without help it's a full-time job keeping them you know calm and away from each other in a way and i have to work you know who, who's who's the breadwinner it's me and the school my son's elementary school understood that and they were willing to let him come back we came back on 19th december and the school ran till christmas eve and then i find that the headmaster of the school the principal you know calls the education department in, in Kobe where i live and he's told like no they, they can't because it's you know quarantine and i was thinking that's laughable for a start you know 90 percent of the kids are not being tested and he's been tested four times he was tested four times separate times negatively and also I'd had it checked and I got, I got really angry, but I thought to myself, I've won these kind of battles before if I fight hard enough, but is it worth it? Cause I'm leaving soon. But I thought the, the attitude was totally terrible. What made me angry was knowing what kind of person made the decision, totally robotic old men in a room. I'm sorry to be, you know, sound prejudiced, but I, I, I'm 99% sure it was that kind of person. They've gone through the system. They're robotic. They're totally, I said, I made this point several times to my friend. I said, it doesn't matter if, He'd had a negative test every day, day on day and doubt. They wouldn't, they wouldn't budge. They mm -hmm. because they think the rule is the rule. We have to depend on it because the rule is there, and that kind of inflexibility, I feel it more now because I've been here eighteen years, and probably before I would let it wash under the table or I go with the flow more. But now, because I see Europe coming, my my sensitivity and patience for such needless things is really low. I don't think it's good for Japan, not good for me, but it's just you know, it's such a I don't know, a waste and needless. I think it's just totally needless. But I, I blame the system. I mean, I don't want to make this a Japan bashing, you know, monologue. But honestly, I want to say my opinion. The education system in Japan is designed to feed information in, instructions and orders. I know this because I've been a PTA. I've been at the sharp end. I've been, you know, involved with the school. The teachers in my son's school are, are great, but they work within the system. And the system is designed to have the kids come in be docile, listen to instructions, even orders, you know. And the teacher will always say at the end, do you have any questions? Shitsman, Imaska. And no one, no one puts their hand up, no one does, you know. The nail that stands up will be hammered down. And it's never more evident the education system. And I knew that the guys making the decision on quarantine, they were products of that system. So it's no surprise to me, you know, they, they don't even think about it. They wouldn't listen to anything to say, no, we made a decision. And that for me is very, at this point of my time in Japan, my tolerance for that is extremely low. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cathartic to share that as well. Mm -hmm. you, get what I mean? you get what I mean, I think, don't you? Yeah. Right, because the way bureaucracy is set up in Japan is obviously it's set up to address the most mainstream situations, the most common situations, but anything that falls outside of those, it just cannot cope with them. Like there's no way to do anything outside of this narrow kind of lane that's been set up so if you have any needs for exceptions or any special accommodations it's very hard to get anything done they're not comfortable with outside the box is what we we enjoy in the west we kind of encourage it in a way that's why we have you know innovative thinkers and japan does not it's not completely without these people but they 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 thrive despite the system not because of it they have to be like mavericks and you know probably they get in trouble at school and they probably get bullied because they don't follow the system as you said exactly they, follow, they don't feel comfortable outside the box that's why in a cafe they don't they give me milk because the, the, the boss has obviously said we don't give milk with tea we don't give butter with bread because you know it probably costs more and, and you know I, again i mean i could give you an anecdote about butter I, I have some bread i want some butter with it and they if you push hard enough they go to the fridge and they give you some cooking butter but they hate they hate it they, they look at you with like daggers in their eyes because they don't like it and I sometimes fight my corner 
not because I want to make the life difficult, because I feel I feel it's justified. But as you said, you have to expend a lot of energy. And I don't always do that now because, you know, it's, it's end game. But um, again, you know, the immigration is controversial. This Jap- a lot of Japanese people aren't aware that until recently, or even now, foreigners coming back into Japan from most countries have to have a test 72 hours before flying back. But Japanese nationals don't have to. And that's in black and white with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. You know, Japanese nationals don't have to submit to this extra COVID test. Everyone's tested on arrival, but foreigners have to have an extra test. Leaving aside the fact that around us in the plane are full of Japanese people who haven't been tested, which is ridiculous. And again, that for me is a clumsy disincentive. It was literally, we don't want people traveling, so we have to put something in the way. There's no other reason for it. And um, my, my sensitivity to this is, is, is greater now. Um, but I did make the point, I made two points recently when I was airing these criticisms. I said, I'm not afraid to criticize my own country before someone throws out at me. Someone will throw that at me because I'm from the UK. I said, I think Brexit is a calamity. I, I cannot forgive Brexit. I mean, I cannot forgive my freedom of movement being taken away, which is why a big reason why I'm going to Germany instead of the UK. And COVID is among the worst in the world. The rate of infection and the number of people who you know, passed away per capita in the UK is probably the worst in the world. So I said, I, I'm, I'm very ready to criticize my own country. The second point is that no one would live 18 years if they, didn't, if they hated everything about Japan. I don't hate everything. I had some great times here. But I feel like I, I, I had enough, seen enough, done enough here to, to give a valid opinion on the system. Yeah. Right. As an American, looking at the past four years, I always feel weird commenting on those kind of nationalistic policies in Japan because obviously our policies in the previous years have been less than idyllic. But yeah, I understand what you're coming from. You have these criticisms because you love Japan, because you have this deep connection with Japan and you want it to be in the same way you want England or whatever country you're going to be moving to in the future to be the best it could be. You have those same feelings towards Japan. So I completely understand that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's many points that come into my mind when we're talking. Um, it's, it's not a Japan bashing diatribe, not at all. It's, it's, it's an inconvenient truth sometimes. Some of what I'm saying are inconvenient truths. And actually, when I put that point, no one really questioned it because it was true. You can't. But, you know, the other thing, I mean, it's a wide topic, but the, the refugees thing. Japan donates a lot of money with JICA because I, I know because I've, I've often translated and edited JICA reports. You know, so overseas aid for Japan is very high, I would say. They do spend a lot of money, taxpayers' money on helping people overseas. But you look at numbers, how many refugees they let in Japan? They let about 30, literally. It's like that. It's like 20, 30, 40. And when you think about you know, the other extreme, Germany, a million, I mean, that may be too much the other way. But I, I think to myself, it's insulting. Like, it'd be better if you didn't let anyone in. You know, how do you pick these 30 people? And in a way, it's just a joke. You know, 30 people, a country of 120 million. How do you pick those 30 people? wouldn't it be better to not do any? Because it's like leaving a tip of two cents. You know, it's better not to leave anything. You know what I mean? That, mm. that, that kind of feeling. So I feel like I'm never afraid to speak my mind. And, and one more point is, that, you know, my wife is Japanese. So the, the point about the testing for COVID before I go back, my kids are Japanese, you know, nationalities. So I was the only one who had to do it. And she wasn't aware until recently. And she was shocked as well. She said, that's like prejudice, that's racist. I said, yeah, I said, that is purely, you know, it's just done on nationality, as if the virus can distinguish, you know. Yeah, so, you know, these points, I'm not afraid to air them these days. And sometimes I think there's, there's one thing as well, which I've noticed as well, you know, there's many forums which we, we have online, there are groups about Japan, expats in Tokyo, expats in Japan, foreigners in Japan. And there are some groups, most of the people there are foreign, there are a few Japanese members, but most of them are people like me who live in Japan. And you may have noticed this in your own, you know, online world, but when you, when you talk about Japan in a critical way, there are many foreigners who will jump on you and they will, they, will, they will get hysterical in a way and they'll say like, no, Japan is Japan. Japan has the right to do what it wants. If you don't like it, leave. You know? and, and it's like, I see it as a kind of, I don't know what the word is, sycophancy or Stockholm syndrome. It's like an inconvenient truth. You don't want to hear this, do you? Because your, your image of Japan is different. It's a reality. And by the way, yes, I, I said this about UK, so don't try and tell me that I don't criticize my own country. Every country has good and bad, but don't try and sweep it under the carpet. It's not a land of milk and honey. You know, there are good and bad, good and bad here, and it's, it's, it's healthy to discuss both. So, yeah, that's, that's my perspective, you know. Mm-hmm. 
and you're free to say your opinion. Japan is free to ignore it. That's just how it works. Like, yeah, just because you say something doesn't mean you're actually physically trying to force Japan to change single handedly. It's just something you've noticed. So you're pointing it out and you have yeah. ideas of how it could be better. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think Kasumi Gaseki, if I go to there, you know, on, on the Shinkansen, I go and try and knock on the door of the immigration department and say, like, I want to talk to the boss, you know, this is not on, you know, I don't think they're going to, you know, mold policy around what I want. But, uh, you know, I think it's healthy to speak your mind. And, uh, I stand by what I say and that usually, you know, I can, I can justify it. But yeah, I think most people don't want to rock the boat in a way, but I feel like I've earned, I don't know how you say earned, earned your spurs or something. I've, I've been around the block here. I know, I know the country and I've been to almost every prefecture and I think I've, I've been quite deeply into Japan. I've even been to islands, you know, like, you know, Yakushima, Anamiyoshima, Sadogashima. I've, I've really done a lot here. So yeah. So you talked a bit about how this sort of mindset extends to schooling in Japan, but do you have any insight into medical care in Japan that foreigners should yeah. be aware of? Yeah. Um, well, overall, Japan's medical system is, is good in world standards. I, I, I'm not going to say it's, you know, where it is in the world standards, but it's definitely, you know, one of the better countries for medical care. I haven't had any really serious things happen to me, thankfully, but uh, when I've needed a doctor, I have no real complaints. On, on, a, on a personal level, the patient manner is often different here. I can remember one anecdote in Kobe. Uh, I just, I don't know, I'd just been getting thin and I, I hadn't been exercising. So you end up having you know, panics and you think, oh, you know, I'm dying of cancer because it must be because, you know, I'm, I'm getting thin and I'm not running or whatever. So you go to the hospital and I think I probably convinced them to scan, to, you know, to, to look, my, look through me. And uh, so the day came, and I wasn't looking forward to it. And I said to them, well, just, just put me under. I don't want to remember any of it. You know, just, just put me out. And that probably wasn't in their schedule. But they actually, they, 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 they bent on that one. Because I think most of the time, they wouldn't have done that. But the, late, the nurse who, who met me, she just gave me a beacon. She said, drink that. And I said, hang on. I said, what are you asking me to drink? Exactly what is that? And, you know, a Japanese person would have just drunk it. And uh, what I've noticed about a medical thing here is that doctors and teachers have seen, well, they're both called sensei. They're, they're treated reverently. They, they have this higher status, which is fair enough because they're you know, doing a, a vital job. But in the Western perspective, we question, we get second opinions. We ask them why. We might ask, we might ask a second doctor or a third doctor. And we want to know why, and we want to kind of have a bit of to and fro. Again, like the school system in Japan, when they typically go to a doctor, they will just listen to what the doctor says. says, okay, how long do I take this for? What do I take? Okay, thank you. And you know, that was a difference I found. The other thing I mentioned here is a, a topical point, and I, I don't want to be too controversial here. Uh, as, I, as I made the point just now, I'm not like uh, out to bash Japan, but I think it's a valid point. As, as we know, America and Europe are having a terrible time with COVID. Japan, relatively speaking, is not in the same boat in terms of numbers. The numbers are not good, but they're not crazy like you know, Europe or US. You know. But having said that, the headline in Japan Times today is like patient dying. Uh, it's literally, I'm reading it now, virus patients dying, unable to access care. And, you know, Japan's hospitals at limit, you know, all the headlines. And we think, why? Because Japan has more beds per capita and the numbers are not that bad. Why? And I made that point in the group today. And it was really insightful what the comments were, you know, some of the people who have relatives working in hospitals. Basically, the system is not set up for it. And there's, there's all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, the, the, the hospital beds are there but the system is not designed to cope with the pandemic. And uh, oh, the public hospitals are, are taking COVID patients, but the private hospitals aren't, which is why there's so much strain on the system. And these are kind of systemic problems which require big decisions from the top. And as we, as we all know, that doesn't happen quickly in Japan at all. I mean, to, to give perspective on that, that thing, you know that the change from Hanko, the, 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 the kind of kerfuffle over switching Hanko to digital, to be honest, it was a tiny point in most people's book, but in Japan, it's a huge issue. It's front line, front page news, you know, so that is much less scale. So to change the way the hostel's organized, well, to be for a start, you can't do it in this timing available, but it shows me that, you know, I was thinking if you had the number of patients that Europe or America had, we'd be, we'd, you know, we'd, we'd be in chaos. The whole country would collapse. So, you know, I think, I have a wide spectrum now and I, I read a lot of things and, you know, I, I do notice, I make my opinion felt, to be honest, in this area now. So 
the medical system is good, but it's not coping with COVID very well at all, I would say. And another complicating factor of that is it's hard to get clear information on it, but at least from my friends' experiences in Japan, it sounds like it's really hard to get tested. So it's hard to know for sure if the numbers are accurate, if testing isn't available. So there's just a lot of complicating factors going on with the bureaucracy and hospitals there. Exactly. It's very hard to get tested. I had to get a test for my son because he can't wear a mask for, for 13 hours on a plane. So the airline said, okay, he has to have a medical test within 72 hours of flying. So I had to pay 30,000, literally 30,000 yen. And I had to find a place that would test him. And it wasn't that straightforward. And, you know, I think another friend was worried because I had a temperature and they had to kind of, they had to badger the hospital to give him a test. Obviously, there's someone on high who said, we don't want widespread testing, you know. Why? Well, I don't know. Maybe they don't want it because I, I honestly believe, yeah, if you, have, if you tested across the board like everywhere else, numbers would be much higher. It'd be even more scary. It's bad enough now, you know. But people are saying that Japan is, has much fewer people infected because of mass compliance and so on. That is one, one factor. But I think a bigger factor is probably, as you said, lack of widespread testing. Because a lot of people are asymptomatic, as you know. You know? So that, that was the point about my son as well. You, know, you, you say my son can't go to school. He's had four tests about all the people around him haven't been tested. What a ridiculous argument. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I felt angry about that one. Yeah. So then you were talking about your son in the education system. And do you have any advice for non-Japanese people who are thinking about raising families in Japan? Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's a very safe country. And it's a great experience to live here. Uh, I don't want people to listen to my podcast and, and think, oh, it's not. Because I, I, I've been here 18 years and I'm, I'm, I'm an intense person. And if it wasn't my cup of tea, I wouldn't have been here. I have had great experiences here. And anyone who you know, would like to ask me more about that, I'd be happy to share. But my situation, I have a special needs kid, and that's very difficult. Japan is not great at special needs. But if anyone, for example, had a special needs child and was in Japan, which could well happen, I would say that the mainstream, the stuff you get from the government horse's mouth is just okay and not great. What I have had to do is look beyond that to things like NPOs and citizen organizations and online. And, you know, for example, one approach that I would take would be to describe my situation in detail in Japanese and share it with a group of, of people who have disabilities or they, have, they care for people with disabilities. And then you get the word of mouth thing, which is very strong in Japanese society. You get people who recommend people. And when you have an NPO, you know, like, a, or NGO, sorry, non-governmental organization, that is more likely to deal with things like autism the government has a certain amount of provision, but these centers are always not in the mainstream middle of town. They're always on the edge, geographically on the edge. You don't see people with Down syndrome very often in mainstream society here. These people do exist, but they are not kind of included in the mainstream planning. And Japan, Japan is lacking quite a lot in that area. The most visible thing it does is put the yellow, yellow tags on the, on the train platforms you know, for blind people. But in terms of dealing with, for example, mental special needs, autism, uh, Asperger syndrome, very lacking. I know, I know from first-hand experience, and I don't think you know, Europe is perfect, but it's, a, it's miles ahead of Japan. And yeah, I mean, in my situation, literally, I have to find people and pay them extra to fill the gaps in the service so I get enough help you know, for, my, for my son. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to work properly. And it is frustrating. It is what it is, but um, that is part of the reason why I'm moving. He's, he's due to finish elementary school. The, the teachers in his school were great, but the system wasn't great. So, but, but given the effort the teachers made, I felt, well, let's let him finish. And then before he goes to junior high, I think you would prove the best. So, but yeah, it's not easy. And probably online is the best way to find a fine context and uh, find people in a similar situation. Another, another example I, I had in mind was, this is kind of technique I used recently, but you know, when you have a kind of area like special needs or some kind of area you don't know much about, you want to find people who are expert. I can imagine doing things like this. So you go on Amazon Japan, you know, Amazon, we all use Amazon and Amazon Japan is, you know, I use it almost daily basis. Um, I even have the president, he's my Facebook friend. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so special needs Japan, I might type in like special needs Japan in Japanese into Amazon and you're going to get some books come up of people who are written in Japanese about it. Now on a different topic, I did this technique where I typed in an area I wasn't, 
you know, really conversant in, but I wanted to research this, this topic. And I did it on Amazon. I found some people who were expert in that area. And then I found on LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn is, I think you and I got to know each other on LinkedIn. And I, you know, I find Japanese people don't really use LinkedIn, but I think it's really powerful. So the ones that do use LinkedIn tend to be the influential ones, the ones who are really kind of international. For example, it could be a popular author or something. They would probably have some kind of presence on LinkedIn. So my way would be, for example, to find some top people who've written books in Japan. Find these people on LinkedIn if you're on it. Try to contact them. They probably would be ha- very happy to hear from you because most people wouldn't bother. And, and my, my approach in a way is always try to go outside the box. And that's one way. I mean, yeah, there's lots of anecdotes to give you there, though, but I tend to do that. I tend to write to people at the very top because I feel that that's where you get the main results. Right. That's a very interesting point about LinkedIn is I've said multiple times that there aren't very many overall Japanese people on LinkedIn, but the people who are on LinkedIn are usually like you said, very influential, very internationally minded, just because Japanese people on LinkedIn would be more international because it's not an inherently Japanese thing. So I think that's a great thing to look out for. It's a great resource to use if you're trying to make things happen. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 asked, I've told students before, you know, even students, they think I'm a student, why am I doing here? But I said, you know, you don't have to be a businessman. You have Blue Ocean here. You're a Japanese person. You put your stuff out in English, which I can help with because I like to encourage people. And there was one of my friends who was doing a project on Sudan, South Sudan, you know, for her thesis. And I, I, I gave the same idea to her. And I said, you try that. You, you type in South Sudan in Amazon and you find a guy on LinkedIn, you message him. And, uh, you know, it worked. The guy, one of, one of the guys was a, a 30-year correspondent there. And he actually said he'd be happy to answer questions. It's funny. You know, it doesn't always work. But I think these things, these, it's very, it's not a normal approach. But I, I, that's my kind of brain, I think. I think I... I'm always a bit like, you know, edgy and maverick-like, and that, that kind of approach serves me well sometimes, I think, you know, because there's so many people now that aren't doing everything that if you, if you try and do what everyone else is doing, you, you just lose without trace, you know, you have to be different, so. Right. I'm reading a book called Making It Big in Japan right now, and one of the points that was just covered is you obviously should do your best to respect Japanese culture, to abide by rules, but you also can't play the game. You can't go in thinking that you're going to play the game because the game wasn't set up for you. You have to figure out what works best for you, what's your competitive advantage in the context, rather than, oh, I'll just be a Japanese person because you'll never be a Japanese person. Uh, Exactly the point has been made many times, but you know, recently on YouTube, this is kind of boom of people who, who try to speak perfect Japanese in you know, accent coaching and they go to incredible ends. They probably watch, you know, five or six hours of YouTube a day and they, they try to hone their Japanese perfectly. And I don't think this is a great role model because as you said, it's not about, it's not about language at all. My Japanese could be 10 times better than now. and doesn't matter. The fact that even I have a foreign name is enough for me to get a different reaction. You know, you and I probably know that. So don't try and be Japanese because, you, you know, it's trying to, um, it's about as useful as a chocolate fire guard. You know, it's like, it's, it's not going to work. You, your energy and your, your thoughts are much better used. Acknowledging a status, speaking Japanese to a good level, doesn't have to be perfect, a good level is enough. And maybe instead of trying to be Japanese, I would say, show the Japanese you interact with that you understand their culture and respect it, but you don't necessarily, for example, tatemai and konde, you know, which is always a bugbear for me. So tatemai, you know, the saying things and portraying what you think the listener wants to hear very, very simplistically. And honne is the real, when you're having drinks with your friends, the real thing that comes out, you know, the inside and the outside, the public face and the real thoughts. So very simply, you can show Japanese people you know that. And they kind of treat you a bit differently, I think. If you have an interaction with Japanese people and you say like, I know, you know, you're being nice to me because it's kind of expected, but... Would you like to really stay in touch? I mean, it's, it sounds clumsy, but if you do it in the right way, I think that, that kind of thing can work. I've had that situation before because they always try to be nice. And uh, when you're new in Japan, you think, oh, they all love me. You know, they all want to be my friend and they all want to, you know, be my Facebook friend and, you know, line and everything. And um, it's not a big deal for them. But for, for Western people, it's like we would only make that kind of effort if we really want to be friends with someone, you know, in our culture. Otherwise, we'd be polite, but not, you know, effusive. But in Japan, sometimes they go to that effusive level and you think, oh, this is, this is, you know, Japan is the friendliest country in the world. 
No, it's not. It has the best service by some criteria. They're efficient, they smile because they're, it's, it's kind of expected and it's like a DNA thing. But it doesn't mean they are heartfelt, want to be your friend. And that, that, that's a very simple difference, but it's a very difficult one to get. And there are times even now when I, I feel like I, oh, I got, I, I, my radar wasn't working. You know, that person went through the radar and uh, I actually thought they were solid and they're not. But, you know, that's a, that's a key point. I think succeeding in Japan, learning to read the room, read people, it's not a quick fix, I can say, but that is a really crucial skill to getting ahead in Japan, I think, is that ability to see the situation, to, to remain on top of the situation and to remain polite, but also, I don't know, you know, show them that you know what's happening. I think it's important, yeah. So then we talked a lot about coping on more of a everyday level, everyday life level, but going back to more career focused issues, in your opinion, what tends to make a company more family or woman friendly in Japan? Well, overall, I can't say that it's a, it's a family or woman friendly workplace in most cases. Japanese companies who have a lot of overseas interests and branches the more they have that, the more likely they are to be international in terms of family-friendly policies because they feel they have to be. They have shareholders overseas. And I worked with a company called Recruit. Now, Recruit is a big HR company, and they're quite progressive. They start in Tokyo, but they have all, you know, they're in the top 10 HR companies in the world. Um, another, another big HR, HR company is Pasona. It just so happens they're recruitment companies. They could be in from another industry, but they have things like a crash in the office or they have schemes to encourage women to go back after having a baby, which seems very normal to us, but in Japan it's very rare. And I think that the more international a company gets, the more it has to kind of bend in that way. And in a way, the more Japanese a company, the less likely it is to have that kind of family-friendly policy because the people making decisions may not have been overseas or they don't, there isn't the same pressure. There isn't the same pressure to, to bend. I mean, I, if you're working for IKEA Japan, for example, IKEA is a huge company, international from Sweden. And Sweden is famous for being family friendly. I'm quite sure that they would give generous, you know, leave policies and family friendly. But, but yeah, I think um, you, you'd have to research that. And um, in a way, I suppose the ideal would be to talk to people who've worked there. I suppose social media in a way, I don't know how you'd do it, but the ideal would be to talk to someone who knows that company. I suppose on LinkedIn, again, going back to LinkedIn, you can find people who have worked in a company before. And one way would be to kind of, if you're thinking about a company, you could talk to them about it. And I think that might be a way of kind of getting from the horse's mouth. I, I can imagine that would be one way to kind of get some insight into it. Or if you were in a, a big group of families in Japan, like a Facebook group or something, you could ask people to like private message if necessary, but can anyone give me examples of companies they know who are family friendly? And I think, you know, there's like foreigners who are more likely to give honest views on that one. That would be some ideas that just come off to me off the cuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice to not be afraid to reach out to people to ask them what the situation is, because my first impulse is usually to try to do research, but you can only find so much information publicly posted online probably a lot more effective to speak with actual alum of the company to figure out what's going on, for sure. I think if you find the right person, there's no reason why they wouldn't give you an honest answer because, you know, these things are not kind of confidential in a way. It's just, you know, every company is different. But it's definitely worth, if you were thinking of moving and you had a family and you were worried about what would happen, that would be my approach. What I said to you, actually, I didn't have planned in my head. It just came. That's the kind of thing, you know, I think spontaneously, they were the ideas that just came into my head. But if it's useful, it's great. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, for sure. Or, or, I mean, one more idea, just, just sorry, briefly, would be, I've done this sometimes. And, you know, literally, if you go, go to Google or something, you type in Family Association Japan, even keywords like that, you'll get some kind of organization. You might, it might not be a huge one, but you'll get some kind of NGO or some kind of organization set up. Because they have them for everything. They have them for, you know, everything you can think of as some kind of organization. And you could contact them and you get some feedback. I think, you know, that kind of thing as well. That would be one approach I would think of. Mm -hmm. I think that's another great resource. So, yeah, don't be afraid to get creative in trying to scope out the situation. Definitely. So we've talked quite a bit about this already. But do any other examples come to mind of communication breakdowns in Japan that are due to culture? I think... The key thing to realize is that people who 
like I said, are really concerned about speaking Japanese better, there comes a point where it doesn't matter if you speak well or extremely well, you're not going to get a better response unless you tune into the culture. So your energy is in your time with better spent learning culture and language. I don't mean to say that. I think you know the point I'm making. There comes a point where you can make yourself understood in any situation. And if you go from there to obsess about your accent, I never think it's a problem, to be honest, to have a little bit of accent. I know I, I have more than a little bit of accent in Japanese when I speak. But, you know, I never worried about that because more important than that is tuning into the culture, the, the, the body language and the unspoken, you know, the, what, what the Japanese person is telling you with their gestures and what their, their actions and the real message they say verbally. That is a very crucial difference. And learning to read that will make your life much easier, much more than language. Language is the first big thing. But after language, the cultural thing is even bigger. And um, it affects the whole, everything in society here. You know, even online chat, you know, online chat, you can kind of get a sense of it. Um, the typical example, you know, be sounds good. Japanese will often say sounds good. You, you suggest a social encounter, they say sounds good. And uh, if you're not, you know, tuned in, you think, oh, I think they're, they're up for it. You know, they're up for it. But actually, it's a no. Sounds good is 99.9% .9 no. It's not quite anything other than yes, it is no, but it's close to that. It's close to that. And again, to get a yes, you, you don't always get a yes anyway, but I think the way I would do it, if I really wanted a yes in that situation, I'd say like, I know X and Y and Z, and I know you normally say this and you mean this, but is, is, is something possible? You know, that's, that's, it's kind of like acknowledging, you know, you know, the situation, you know, why, why they're doing that. It's a bit complex, but you do see what I mean. Yeah, I definitely do see what you mean. There's a lot of, especially with YouTube polyglot influencers, there's a big focus on perfectionism that I feel like is honestly a waste of time. There's so much so. more you can learn with that time about Japan, about Japanese people, or even just taking that time you're spending perfecting your pitch accent and developing a new vocabulary set. Obviously, you should have good pronunciation, but again, taking that to that extra step to try to literally sound like a Japanese person, that energy could be better spent elsewhere. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I, and I don't even think the Japanese watching those videos, they may think it's, it's, I'm sorry to say, but it's almost like a performing seal. It's like a performing seal who can who flip a ball on his nose 10 times. They think it's very entertaining. They don't have huge respect. They don't. They may, you know, they may get some comments, but there's a, maybe it's an acknowledgement, and it's almost like Japanese. You don't look at the screen, you think it's Japanese. But in, in the terms of the everyday, day-to-day -day interaction, that's not going to get you much further in Japan. No, it's mm -hmm. not. It may get you some bonus points, and you know, you're going to get, you're going to impress some people. But in the bigger picture, yeah, as you said, there are much better ways to use your time and energy. That's a really good point. I would say I like to dumb that point home. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember back to my French class at university and I speak French amazingly actually my French and German stayed intact after you know over 20 years which I was really happy with it's not perfect but it's you know I would say three quarters still there but I was learning French in the UK you know and um, there were people in the French class who would every sentence they would do this uh, like French people you know and, and, and the hand movements and it was totally exaggerated and it was silly it was like pantomime and there were people in Japan who do that as well they, 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 they bow all the time and they say etto all the time and they, they hesitate and it's like a caricature you know it's like you don't why are you trying so hard what, 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 what's this doing you know you might get a few more views on YouTube but you see what I mean it doesn't really have an end product which is fine if it's for you like you can do that because it makes you happy to reach this goal of actually sounding like a Japanese person, but don't expect that to extend to somehow becoming the ultimate Japanese speaker. You have to manage your expectations of what perfecting your Japanese will actually accomplish. Uh, to, to, yeah, to sum up, to sum up brutally, another inconvenient truth: it's not going to open a lot of doors for you. I mean, it might get you more views. It's going to get you more views on YouTube and a few more likes on social media. I don't think it's going to open a lot of doors for you. No, it's not. So then besides that, besides the whole not spending all of your time trying to master Japanese or become Japanese somehow, if you were speaking with somebody who wants to go to Japan for business, who maybe knows absolutely nothing about Japan or its culture, and you only had time to teach them one thing about it, what would you teach them? Japanese, in business context, Japanese likes subtlety. 
They like to be surprised, but not in a shocking way, in a subtle way. So if it wasn't COVID, let's assume it's no COVID because it wouldn't happen if it's COVID, you know, so no COVID. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm in Seattle or something. And um, okay, for example, I live in Seattle. I'm going to Kobe where I live now. And Seattle happens to be the sister city. So I would research a lot about the Kobe city and the history but also probably social media. I'd look at, you know, the, the company and even funny things about Japan, for example, you know, small talk, like, I mean, Japanese people still laughing when I say Fuji-san is 3,776 meters, you know, it stays in my head. Or, I mean, funny questions like the largest prefecture by size after Hokkaido is Iwate. And, you know, these trivial things, but like, they don't expect foreigners to know and it's kind of like makes them laugh. And I think at the end of the day, we're all emotion driven. And, and, and humor is you know, universal in a way. So if you can put these little nuggets in, you know, obviously you don't speak Japanese, but if you can put these little snippets in, I think it would make a, a big difference. And uh, because Japanese is so homogenous and so it's like designed for Japanese, like hand in the glove. So yeah, maybe that's a bit, a bit honest, but flattery works. I mean, Japanese people like to hear things which are positive about Japan. So not too much cliche, like the toilets are amazing here, you know, or, or, you know, the trains are amazing. But, you know, in a business context, for example, Japan is promoting hydrogen. And that's a really big policy. It's a quite interesting policy. Japan is promoting hydrogen for, you know, power, for cars and electric cars, for example. I would probably look on Google News and look at the latest things happening in Japan. And, and, and if it's a really big thing, kind of mention it and they'll be impressed that you know that. I mean, if it was a normal year, you'd say Olympics, but Olympics is not really happening. But, you know, um, if it was now and the Olympics were going on as normal, I don't think it would happen, to be honest, but anyway, that's another topic. I would probably research Japanese athletes and say in conversation, oh, Japan has the Olympics. And by the way, isn't this athlete really famous? And they, they love that. I think they would love that up. Yeah, maybe right now isn't the best time to bring up the Olympics in casual conversation. But yeah, I understand what you mean by kind of signaling your respect and appreciation for Japan through your knowledge of Japan. That's one reason why Japanese people are sometimes very flattered when you can speak any amount of Japanese, hence the Nihongo Jozu, if you just say konnichiwa. But yeah, you can do that with cultural knowledge of Japan as well. I think that's great. Um, one, one example I do, this is maybe not business context, but it, it, it's a good icebreaker is when I'm talking to someone new, I say, they always ask, why did you come to Japan? And there's a, there's a YouTube clip of the program I saw. Remember, I mentioned to you that Japanese language and people. Now, YouTube, thanks to YouTube, there are clips of it still online. And there's a, a particular clip which I really like about a guy who walked through Japan. He walked through from Hokkaido to Kagoshima. And um, there's 12 minutes of him walking through Ao, Ao Mori Prefecture and staying in a ryokan. And his Japanese is obviously perfect. And he talks to countryside people in perfect Japanese. He goes to an Akachojin in Shinjuku. And it's fascinating. It's like, he, he went out of his way to, to live in the country and to meet Japanese people. And that would be a fantastic icebreaker. That would be like a 10 minute way to show them that, you know, you like Japan and this was a, a kind of a insightful video and they would love that. I think that would be a, one good idea to use. You, um, take a five or 10 minute clip on YouTube about Japan, which you like, and maybe show them. They, they'd love that. So is there anything else you would like to share with the audience today before we wrap things up? Um, I'm really happy to have this chance. It's been a really interesting chat, and I think we've you know covered a bit more than an hour. So thank you for being so patient. Um, and and like I said, these talks just you know they 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 go on by themselves. I don't really have an idea in mind, but I knew it would flow, and it did flow pretty well. I think I I let off some steam, but I I'll finish on a positive note because I have to be fair. I've had some great times in Japan. One of the things I tell people is my favorite prefecture. My favorite prefecture is Nagano. I love Nagano Prefecture. I never lived there, but I've visited many times, especially when I was in Tokyo. It's one hour away on Nagano Shinkansen. And um, I've, I think I've been to every prefecture except three. No real reason, but most of Japan I've covered, you know, five times each to Hokkaido and Okinawa and so on. Why do I love Nagano? I love mountains. The Japanese Alps are beautiful. The, the food is great. Famous for apples, famous for vegetables. It has amazing countryside. And John Lennon used to visit in the 70s. John Lennon used to visit Nagano with Yoko Ono and stay there and um i've stayed in the same hotel where he where he used to stay and i've actually talked to a barman who served him and i love this kind of you know anecdotes and stuff he loved japan and uh 
I can kind of feel a little bit of when I read about him and his time in Japan. It wasn't the same as me, of course, but you know, I can something resonates a bit, and uh, you know, you get a warm, fuzzy feeling. And uh, when I sit in the cafe of that hotel and have the same tea that he used to drink, I feel like oh, it's a nice feeling. So yeah, Nagano for me is the top, but Kobe's not bad, and Tokyo is living the dream. So. You know, those three places are definitely special for me. If you go to Japan, definitely do what you can to get out of whatever prefecture you happen to be in, because there's just so much to see, and every place has its own special attributes. So, the very last point, Kamikochi. I forgot to mention, but Kamikochi in, in Nagano is a K K A M I K O C H I. Kamikochi is um, literally one of those beautiful places in Japan. It's it's cars cannot go into it. It's like Canada in a way. It's it's unspoiled nature. The rivers, you can see the water, you know, clear to the bottom and that is a really stands out as a place that if you're visiting Japan, you want to see natural beauty, that would be close to the top of the list. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. Great advice for people who are maybe planning their future trips to Japan post COVID. <laughs> yeah. So thank yeah, you so much for your trip. time. Yeah. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation and be sure to check out the links in the description of this episode to learn more about Richard Mort and his activities and be sure to follow him on LinkedIn as well. If you enjoyed today's episode, please go ahead and share it with a friend, colleague, or connection on LinkedIn to help spread the message and information shared in this podcast. And please remember to go ahead and subscribe and leave a rating and review if you enjoy the podcast and feel free to email me at businesssuccessjapan at gmail.com all one word, all lowercase, if you have any other questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes or interview topics. Also, be sure to reach out if you would like to contribute as a guest on the podcast to share your own cultural insights into doing business in Japan. If you'd like to leave a voice message, you can find a link to do so in the description as well. But for now, remember that the more you learn, the more confident you will become as you explore all of the opportunities Japan has to offer you. Until next time, mata kondo!